Welcome to episode four of the Midnight Kingdom lecture series based on my book, The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Uh, this is the story of how white supremacist lies, religious mythologies, and conspiracy theories created the modern world uh, for the benefit of the wealthy and the powerful, and especially how we're going to get out of this crisis and make a better and brighter future. If you haven't ordered your copy yet, you should remedy that. It's a good book. I think you'll appreciate it, and the people around you who are looking for answers will as well. Uh, if you haven't watched the rest of this series, uh, go back and check out episodes 1, 2, and 3. And while you're at it, subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can know when these come out, including the fifth and final chapter of the Midnight Kingdom lecture series. Uh, this has been a good time. Uh, I really enjoyed getting this information out there because I happen to believe that it is absolutely crucial that we understand where we're coming from and how we've arrived at this moment. One of the reasons why the right wing continues to go after history and teachers is because they understand that their only means of winning when it comes to these cultural wars and political battles is by obscuring how we've arrived at this point in the first place. Uh, continue to dig, continue to learn, and continue to be pissed off, quite frankly, about how we've arrived at this moment. Because those are the only means that we're going to find in order to make our way out of this mess. And now, episode four of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series. When we left off in episode three of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series, we were looking at a post-World War II war in which the United States, Russia, and Great Britain as the Allies had defeated Nazi Germany and Italy and Japan and had before them a, a brand new opportunity to change the world. Unfortunately, a lot of the ideas that were fermented at the time, including Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, policy of the world's policemen, in which the major nations would uh, enter into a partnership together and enjoy a lasting peace in which they would take over the security of the world and ensure that no further wars or oppression would uh, take place, those things fell apart especially as FDR died and was replaced by his vice president, Harry Truman, and a lot of hardliners within Washington, D.C. and the uh, intelligence establishment pushed for Truman to take a hard stance with Russia. This also included the advisement of Winston Churchill, who never rested in terms of trying to turn the United States against their allies, the Soviet Union. As a result, when the war ended, Truman and the rest of the Washington establishment basically went ahead and kept the United States on a war footing. Now, usually after one of these conflicts, you will see the, the belligerents demobilize and begin to move towards a peacetime economy. Instead of that, the United States continued to mobilize, uh, ensuring that a huge amount of funds were being constantly shifted into war making and war making potential. Uh, th this, by the way, would lead to what Dwight D. Eisenhower, actually one of the architects of the project in the first place, would eventually call the military-industrial complex. Basically, after the war had ended, the United States needed to continue to develop these wars and to continue a lot of the departments that had been in place during the war. As a result, America's economy became more or less a war economy. What you started to notice was a push towards technology that could possibly uh, make the difference in this developing Cold War with the Soviet Union, which the United States and Britain both believed was inevitable. Uh, you started to see a push towards automation, uh, developing uh, scientific ideas. Uh, the social sciences and the sciences were largely dedicated with uh, increasingly large investments of cash from the government. And in, in a way, a lot of this started to take place in a, a centralized location, which were the public universities and universities around the United States. You started to see a lot of these universities and colleges would essentially get a lot of their funding because they started to uh, interrogate these ideas that could possibly turn the tide in this developing Cold War. This include, included weapons systems. This included uh, everything from the space race to missile technology, which the United States, by the way, had a little bit of a heads up in because they had imported a ton of Nazi war criminals in order to help them develop 
their missile program. You also see a lot of the social sciences, psychology, sociology. You start to see a lot of them uh, developed towards starting to understand the human mind. And the idea was that there was a war on for the mind in the battle between the United States and the Soviet Union. Included in that, the battle between capitalism and communism. The idea was that communism was sort of a mind disease, and this was uh, a, a relic from the uh, origins of communism, of course, uh, where the, uh, the, the Marxists took over Russia in the Russian Revolution. The idea that was constantly being expressed by people like Woodrow Wilson was that communism was a disease that ate on the dead tissue of liberal democracy. And if people weren't happy and if they didn't feel like democracy was giving them the results that they wanted or that capitalism was necessarily fair, then the mind disease of communism might find entry points. And so as a result, the social sciences looked at a lot of this. They looked at ways to change people's minds, ways to... Uh, apply uh, soft and hard measures around the world, including using propaganda and pressures to keep the so-called second and third world under the thumb of the United States of America. You also start to see with intelligence organizations such as the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, a developing uh, push to go around to other countries in the so-called second and third world and disrupt their elections, uh, spread propaganda, uh, just make sure that there, there's no sort of a push to uh, install anybody or elect anybody who might run afoul of the United States and uh, their, their uh, you know, capitalist globalist program. As this is taking place, the CIA very, very quickly starts to grow beyond the purview of the presidency. Uh, Harry Truman, who was at the helm uh, when the CIA came online, just told everyone constantly that he was afraid that this was going to happen. And then eventually, even later on in his life, would sound the alarm that the CIA was growing much too large. The CIA, as one of the main pushers of this capitalist program around the world, it would, of course, you know, be one of the first places to detect any possible uh, challenges to capitalism or to even you know, start to detect future challenges of capitalism, um, was run by a lot of unelected people. So as a result, you started to have twin uh, machines going within the United States. Uh, you had elected officials who had uh, democratic consequences to their actions, and you had a lot of appointed officials, people that, you know, most of us never knew the names of in the first place, that were removed from democratic consequences. Now, in a lot of ways, this was uh, the target goal of administrators, uh, people, again, who through people like Woodrow Wilson wanted to create this sort of technocratic class of people, these experts who would sort of run things behind the scenes as the rest of us gazed upon the maze and the, the construction and all. You started to have the uh, development of what is now called in our modern parlance, the quote unquote deep state. Now, I want to go ahead and say very quickly Undoubtedly, you've heard of the deep state and a lot of these conspiracy theories that echo the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that we've covered in past episodes. So when somebody like a Donald Trump or people on the right wing, they talk about the deep state, more or less, this is wink, wink, nudge, nudging. You know, this is this is sort of trying to tell people that there are shadowy figures that are pulling the strings. But in fact, what we're talking about is an administrative technocratic state which is what developed in the United States of America and a lot of the major Western powers. Um, it, it made sure that there was a continuity of purpose that took place behind the scenes, largely away from the purview of elections. Now, one of the best examples of how this has taken place involves John F. Kennedy. Uh, the, the president uh, elected after Dwight D. Eisenhower, after Eisenhower had warned us about the military-industrial complex. Kennedy comes into office, and one of the, the first major tests that he has to deal with uh, is, is this uh, absolutely disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. And what Kennedy ends up doing is he, he takes responsibility for it. But what we find out is that 
Kennedy had hardly any role whatsoever in greenlighting this project or directing this project. It was actually a holdover from the Eisenhower administration. The CIA was simply going to do what the CIA was going to do regardless of who it was that they had to answer to. And Kennedy and other leaders around the world, including people like Charles de Gaulle, would say, you know, I think some of these intelligence agencies, I think some of these groups that are beyond democratic purview, I think they're off their leash. I think that they are just, they're doing a little bit too much on their own, and they're actually threatening the democratic process. They're actually threatening liberal democracy as it stands. But what you see with the CIA and even the FBI in the United States is you see these intelligence apparatuses that are constantly fighting against anything that they perceive as a threat to their agenda, which is this capitalistic, uh, American-led agenda. As a result, both the FBI and the CIA, against its own charter, spy on their own people. Uh, They violate constitutional rights left and right. The CIA for a while is even dosing American citizens with LSD to try and find some sort of a mind control because they believe that, again, the war for the mind can only be won if they're able to persuade people. In all of this, what ends up happening is that this deep state, so to speak, is constantly churning in the background. And it gets to the point where there are all these psychological operations, there are all of these lies, something will happen, and then inevitably there will be some sort of an explanation that, you know, it doesn't quite fit right. It feels like something is happening in the world because something is happening in the world. There are all kinds of people clandestinely acting in order to try and push an agenda and try and shape the world according to their own whims. There grows this culture of of conspiracy theories, of distrust. And of course, by the way, none of this has helped with the assassination of JFK. It suddenly starts to feel as if something has, is gaining a momentum that we can't necessarily put a name to, that we can't necessarily understand. And of course, the war in Vietnam is another one of those instances in which people look around and they say, why in the hell are we in this war? What are we doing? And then, of course, the drafting of young people into that war only increases the frustration with all of this. And so what we see happen in the 1960s and in the 1970s is the development of a a multi-pronged social revolution that we got to take a look at why it happened and why it didn't succeed in the long run. By the time that the 1960s came around, there was a growing frustration with both the United States and the Soviet Union. The original idea was that the battle between communism and capitalism would provide an alternative for people to choose between. These ideologies would somehow or another create a, uh, a choice between what type of a life would be better for the rest of us. But the Cold War, unfortunately, was a battle between two superpowers over resources and power as opposed to an ideological battle between capitalism and communism. In the United States, the paranoia that stemmed from the Cold War was used to the advantage of of the right wing who wanted to destroy the New Deal consensus, you know, ever since it was even uh, proposed in the first place. And as we talked about in a previous episode, the push against the New Deal was uh, just absolutely frenzied and angered from the very beginning. I mean, you know, Franklin D. Roosevelt tried to change things and save the country, and there was a pushback that uh, eventually led to a near coup attempt. In all of this, though, by the time that the war was over, the Republican Party and some of the more moderate elements of the Democratic Party started to push back against the New Deal idea that the government should be investing in the welfare of the people, that there should be a social safety net, that, you know, people should be put to work, that that the government should make sure that people's lives are better and longer and that they're more fulfilled and safer. Um, and eventually what ends up happening is that the, the so-called Red Scare, and this is the second Red Scare in the United States. The first Red Scare takes place after the Russian Revolution in 1917 and eventually goes after labor unions and African Americans because the conspiracy theory is the idea, and you know we'll, we'll get to this in a second, it should sound pretty familiar, that communists were infiltrating labor unions and that they were trying to lead African Americans into a revolutionary situation. As a result, they needed to be put down and put in their place. 
Well, a lot of that takes place again in the second Red Scare. The first thing that happens is that McCarthyism, which we now look on and pretend that everybody, you know, hated and there was only one person. And, and, and that one person, of course, was just absolutely disgusting and everybody thought he was disgusting. No, it was one of the major ideologies and ways to see the world at this time. You know, even as it was said that the State Department was overrun, that America had been betrayed by its leaders, which, by the way, was powered by things like the John Birch Society, which claimed that even Dwight D. Eisenhower was a communist agent. And as this happens, they start going after the the old New Dealers, the people who had proposed the New Deal and carried it out in the first place. This means that they're going after leftists and socialists, and of course there were some of those in the government, but also it's used to go after African Americans. It's used to go after women. It's used to go after gay people. And in this way, the New Deal coalition is destroyed, which starts to lay the foundation for our major change that uh, we're going to get to in just a minute towards the neoliberal consensus. In Russia, what we see is sort of a, a, a shift a, a move away from uh, the old Stalinist tactics. So after Joseph Stalin dies, what you see is Nikita Khrushchev takes over and suddenly he starts proposing that the Soviet Union can create more consumer goods. It can compete on a consumer level with the United States of America, which is a massive, massive change in terms of what this ideology is supposed to do. Now, the United States and the Soviet Union continue battling over the resources that they need in order to create consumer goods and in order to expand their power base. And people start getting pretty tired of it. In the Soviet Union, you see some protests and you start to see around the world a decolonization movement, which, you know, leads to just all kinds of revolutionary situations in which people say, we're, we're tired of having our futures determined for us. You know, uh, you, you see tons of people, everyone from Mao to uh, the Vietnamese people, which, of course, leads to the Vietnam Wars. The United States step, steps in in order to maintain these colonial oppressions. Um, and, and as this starts to take place, you also see around the world a lot of the young people who are coming of age, who are going to college, who are starting out on their own. They start saying, we're tired of both the United States and communist Russia, the Soviet Union. You know, we, we've seen what they have to offer, and we reject it. You see in Germany a lot of the people, they say, you know what? Things haven't changed that much. We still have former Nazis in power. It just so happens that they're working alongside of the United States and these capitalist institutions. You start to people see people say, no, the same fascists are in control. It's just a kinder, nicer fascism. You start to see people in France who say, you know, we're, we're tired of these patriarchal societies. We're tired of this oppression. In the United States of America, you have multiple movements that take place. Uh, beginning, of course, with the civil rights movement, which is is met almost immediately, and nobody ever talks about this because it's unpleasant. It's met with those same conspiracy theories. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders are uh, accused of being communist agents. They say the only reason that these African Americans are protesting for reform and rights and human dignity is because they've been put up to it. Which again, to go ahead and recap something we've been talking about in this entire uh, series, the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series, this is the same story that institutional power and the wealthy always rely on. Here is the nation state. It's good. But guess what? There are people on the outside, communists, Jews, you name it, who are pulling strings to try and destroy the nation state. They're relying on liberal leftist traders and vulnerable communities such as African Americans as unwitting foot soldiers of this potential attack on the nation state. This is how they go ahead and square the circle in, the, in their minds as they go out in the streets and brutalize the civil rights protesters. Now, one of the reasons that eventually they're able to win this battle and push civil, civil rights is because of the advent of mass media and television. The white middle class is forced to look 
on the television and in their newspapers and see the consequences of their own privilege. And one of the things that happens is it brings this problem to a boil. This is one of the reasons why it's so disgusting whenever people look at Martin Luther King, particularly on MLK Day, and say, oh, he wouldn't want protest. He wouldn't, he wouldn't want disruption. It's a lie, and it's a lie that has been engineered in order to try and keep moments like this from developing. Along with civil rights, you also have other movements. You have the free speech movement, which is, uh, uh, you know, as, as you look around uh, the campuses around the country, you have the anti-war movement and the free speech movement that says, you know, this, this insanity has to stop. We have to move beyond these patriarchal oppressions. We have to move beyond these hatreds. We have to move beyond this military industrial complex, and we have to make a better way of life. And as that starts to develop, you see other movements beside it. You see the feminist movement that is starting to make great strides in terms of like equality or at least the beginnings of equality. You see the gay rights movement that comes out of the Stonewall protest and a whole myriad of protests around it. You know, and, and as you start to take a look at this, you realize that we're bordering on the edge of an actual full-fledged social revolution. When this happens... The uh, institutional power has to fight back. And again, this ideology that we keep talking about, it, it relies on what you tell yourself to make the steps necessary. So why you can go out and brutalize people in the streets, why you can brain civil rights protesters, why you can shoot kids who are protesting the war, why you can go out and, and, and you know, just absolutely hurt people in the streets as, as you've been raiding, you know, their gay club. Now, as all of this is happening, the story continues that this isn't about reform, this isn't about progress, this isn't about individual rights or the need to move forward. This is actually just another battleground in the fight against communism. And in fact, it's this evil liberalism, this cosmopolitan liberalism that is just running amok, which is what the right wing and the conservatives tell themselves in order to justify the actions that they're taking. As a result, again, the FBI and the CIA are brought into this battle, constantly going after people, uh, harassing them, violating their constitutional rights, uh, undermining their organizations and their groups because – like they see around the rest of the world with things like Operation Condor, they believe that the left is the most fundamental existential threat that the power structure faces. And what do you see? You see the right wing and moderates join together against the supposed left wing. This is how it always works throughout history, and it's what took place here. Now, the Vietnam War, which of course is absolutely a, a horrific crime against the Vietnamese people. The United States never should have been there in the first place. In fact, the, the Vietnamese patterned their revolution after the American Revolution. And this is one of the biggest problems of all of this when it comes to liberalism is when people take them at their word that everyone is created equal and that freedom is for everybody. What has happened in the wake of those promises has been a system in which the United States has said, eh, you know, some people, they can rule themselves. Other people, eh, probably shouldn't leave it to them. They're not up to the challenge. So what happens in all of this is that you start to push back against these threats. You start to push back against the anti-war movement, the free speech movement, and you start to realize that what is occurring here is that this is either going to reach critical mass or something is going to give. Now, Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, two of the most influential Republicans of, of the modern era, probably since Lincoln, uh, come into the, the forefront. Uh, Ronald Reagan, as governor of California, uh, wages a cultural war against the students in California and just completely scapegoats the universities, uh, turns them into uh, a boogeyman that has to be tamed. And of course, this is where he makes his name as a former actor. Richard Nixon does the same thing at the national level. 
But what he does is he goes ahead and ignites what is now called uh, the Southern Strategy, which was learned in part from the Barry Goldwater campaign, which was pushed by a lot of the same people behind things like the John Birch Society, a absolutely conspiracy theory, hate-driven campaign. Nixon goes ahead and starts to appeal to those moderates who are tired of all of these protests. Uh, he starts to appeal to the so-called silent majority who just want it all to go away. They're so tired of all of this. And, and again, to, uh, you know, Democrats in the South who are a little tired of all these civil rights movements and they, you know, all these civil rights protesters. And Nixon is able to appeal to all of them and create an, an incredible power base for himself. Now, what goes ahead and makes a little bit of the difference is that the draft for the Vietnam War goes away. And when the draft for the Vietnam War goes away, a lot of the anti-war movement starts to cool. Also, going back to a through line that we've talked about in these episodes so far, there is also an economic consumerist appeal that changes things. Suddenly, those kids who are out there protesting, who are, you know, listening to good music and getting high and living this sort of a counterculture lifestyle— Suddenly, a lot of these corporations, they start selling them clothes that denote those principles as opposed to reinforce them. As a result, you can wear jeans all the time. That's great. Absolutely. You can go ahead and wear a band tee and, you know, tell everybody who you are and what kind of a person you are. And, and by the way, it was an absolute dream for the consumer society as opposed to selling, you know, the old, tradu the old traditional gray flannel suit. You suddenly can sell God knows how many things based on the people that the people want to be. What ends up happening, and this is exactly what, what needs to happen in a consumerist overdrive society, you start having to think, who am I and who do I really want to be? And you project out to the world who you want to be. In this way, that social revolution of the 60s and the 70s, it fails. And what happens in the remnants of that failed social revolution is that there is a conservative reactionary pushback. It starts with Richard Nixon. It starts with a, a lot of what uh, starts taking place in, in his administration. But it really, really takes off as you start to see things like the Powell Memo, 1971, in which Lewis Powell, who would go on to be a justice in the Supreme Court, basically sounds the alarm bell that the nation's wealthy need to pool their resources or else they risk having capitalism overturned within the United States of America. What he advocates and what eventually happens is that the nation's wealthy pool their resources and put together uh, the, these projects uh, that are based, by the way, a lot on the fossil fuel industry, uh, which has known, by the way, that they were causing climate change going back into the 1950s. And a lot like the tobacco industry, which knew that it was causing cancer with its cigarettes, they start creating an alternate reality of their own choosing. They're paying off experts to go ahead and create studies that, you know, break consensus. They start flooding universities with money all while they're going ahead and discrediting the professors and academics and the people who are able to speak to these things and illuminate what has happened. And what occurs over these next few decades is an all-out war by the wealthy in the United States and around the world by extension, in which they realized that that failed social revolution was a canary in the coal mine moment, and that the universities and the young people and mass media, you name it, that if they are left to their own, and if this continued, then their own wealth and their own positions of power will be in trouble. And as a result, they pool the resources, they start pushing things, and then we start moving into the 70s and the 80s, and things really, really start to get weird. By the time Jimmy Carter was elected president of the United States of America, the office had had a little bit of its luster uh, removed. Now, of course, we'd already talked about Nixon, and eventually the Watergate uh, scandal would result in his resignation from the office and then the ascension of Gerald Ford to the presidency. By the time Carter was president, uh, the heir... The of paranoia and distrust was uh, was palpable. And he ended up 
going into office at, at just an absolutely awful time. And one of the things that was occurring was that a lot of uh, events that were beyond his control started to uh, you know, take the air out of that presidency and the hope that he had promised to bring to the institution. Everything from the, uh, the Iran hostages crisis to uh, changing economic situations uh, eventually would lead to a situation in which Carter didn't have much in the way of power. Uh, it, it basically, you know, he looked up one day and had to fundamentally realize that the presidency uh, wasn't the all-powerful institution that everybody had thought that it was. This goes back, of course, to the idea of the deep state, the administrative state, or, you know, people like JFK and Richard Nixon, by the way, believing that the machine was beyond the control of the president and maybe beyond control altogether. What Carter has to deal with is a problem that would end up being called stagflation. This is where the economic miracle that had taken place in the United States since the end of World War II. And a reminder, in World War II, Europe had been absolutely bombed to the brink of annihilation. The United States, uh, you know, had dealt, of course, with Pearl Harbor but largely the infrastructure was completely fine. It was still humming. And as a result, as the United States took over the mantle of the most powerful country in the world from Great Britain, what you see is that, you know, it, it starts to, to benefit from all of, of, of those circumstances. Um, you know, the middle class starts to grow. The so-called American dream takes off in which everyone can have a house and a car and the newest, you know, appliances from General Electric. By the time Carter is in power, though, that motor starts having a little trouble. It's not exactly functioning the way that it should anymore. And what Carter has to do is he has to start making concessions to neoliberalism. You see uh, instances like the Volcker shock in which you start to actually engage in austerity. You stop spending all of this money on, on, on these programs and such. There were tremors of this previously. Um, you know, you, people talk about Richard Nixon as, you know, this, this far, far right individual, and he was, but he still functioned within the New Deal consensus. He still had to push programs and ideas and investments that were supposed to make the lives of the citizens better. By the time Gerald Ford took over, Ford, you know, had instances like New York City about to go bankrupt and had told the town to go, to go and drop dead. Carter ends up overseeing a lot of this austerity, not necessarily from his ideology, but because there's no other way around it. Whoever is going to be president is going to basically be pulled along with these economic and material conditions, and it has to be done. Uh, this doesn't make him very popular. Uh, Carter, you know, gives a lot of speeches and talks a lot about people having to start doing without and look in the mirror and think about their consumer choices and, and start to realize that maybe the American way of life was out of control. Well, Ronald Reagan had other ideas. And when Ronald Reagan, who had cut his teeth as a culture warrior in California during the 60s and the 70s, when he comes along, he realizes there's a wonderful opportunity to just sell the American people a lot of bullshit. Instead of telling people, hey, you're going to have to do without, which is, quite frankly, pretty much of a bummer, he starts telling people, oh, it's morning in America. Everything's great. We're not, we're not in decline. We're, we're, on the, we're on the upswing. And by the time Ronald Reagan absolutely washes out Jimmy Carter and takes over the presidency, the world is primed for this new idea, neoliberalism, which we were talking about in the last episode. So what happens? We start drying up all of these social programs. We start pulling money out of these social programs that, that make sure that, that people who, uh, who need it, the poor, the disabled, the older generation, that, that they will be taken care of. We get rid of that funding. We make sure that the government's not going to fund anything, really. And, and while we're doing it, We'll go ahead and deregulate things. We'll go ahead and, quote unquote, set business free. You start also decimating labor unions. You make sure that people aren't going to organize, that they're going to get paid less money to do more work. And I got to tell you, the market loves it. 
absolutely loves it. This is what the market wanted. It wanted to return to the old status quo before the New Deal. A reminder from our previous discussion, the Great Depression and the economic crises of the early 20th century was all because of concentrated capital and unregulated markets. Now, eh, we're far enough away from that. We've destroyed the New Deal coalition. We've gone ahead and used Red Scare paranoia to get rid of all of its advocates and to also go ahead and bring the Democratic Party over into the middle and accept neoliberalism, which, by the way, is what happens whenever Reagan starts uh, lapping them in these elections. You push neoliberalism. You see this in the United States. You see this in Great Britain, of course, with Margaret Thatcher. And all of a sudden, the main operating procedure within the United States, within Great Britain, within the so-called first world, it turns from a New Deal consensus, again, in which you believe that the government should take care of its people and should make their lives better, to a neoliberal consensus, in which the main operating factor is the idea that people's wealth and particularly the wealthy's wealth, should be the main part of freedom, including economic freedom, which is the main type of freedom. Now, this doesn't mean that capitalism is at the heart of all of this, because capitalism involves fair markets. It involves competition. It involves choosing winners and losers. It, it involves choosing the groups of people who are going to benefit the most from this. Under Reagan in the United States alone, we see trillions with a capital T, trillions of dollars redistributed from the middle and the lower classes to the wealthiest 1% of the country. Corporations absolutely go crazy with this. Uh, they are on their own to regulate themselves. And let me tell you something, they do not regulate themselves. Meanwhile, we have to go ahead and use ideology to make sure that all of this works. A reminder, again, ideology is a story that we tell ourselves to explain why we're doing something. Oftentimes, it's because it's why we're doing things. Other times, it's a lie that we tell ourselves and others in order to sleep better at night. So we have to go ahead and use Christianity, much like has, it has been used since the fall of Rome, as we've documented on this series and as I documented in The Midnight Kingdom. You go ahead and start telling a story, and this is the story. One. If you're wealthy in this country, or if you're wealthy in the world, it's because God has chosen you, right? It is a marker of, uh, of God's choosing and love. He, you know, God is a capitalist. That's what keeps getting told throughout the uh, industrialized era. If you are wealthy, you have done well. There's something morally good about you. Now, while we're cutting out all these programs, as inequality is getting worse, as people are being kicked out of their homes and losing their jobs, you have to tell yourself a story, which is those people, something's wrong with them. Like they, they want things given to them, right? And, and we see little stories about this, of course, about welfare queens, people who were using the system to their benefit and trying to get one over on each other, which, by the way, is the main operating pr uh, principle of neoliberalism, the idea that you couldn't possibly trust anybody, that everybody out there is ready to stick a knife in your back and take your wallet and take everything that you have. You start telling a story about Satan, right? The idea that supernatural evil is around in the world. You see the progress and the rationality that has uh, been taking place in the United States for decades. You start seeing it overtaken by stories about, you know, satanic pedophiles in daycare centers. You know, Satan worshipers who are kidnapping children and sacrificing them to their dark gods. And this, like, somehow or another finds purchase. You know, it, it, it absolutely is embraced by our mass media. Uh, popular culture talks about it constantly. Uh, the Soviet Union ends up becoming the center and focus of evil in the world. The Cold War goes from a battle of resources, a battle between capitalism and communism, to a battle between capital G, good, and capital E, evil. That era of the satanic panic is... It, it, it coincides with that conservative reactionary push to go ahead and, and, and push wealth at all cost. It is the story that goes ahead and squares the circle and ensures that a culture will accept what on its face is nothing short of just brutal, brutal austerity. And it does its job. 
it installs in this country a mindset of, of, of conspicuous consumption. You know, people fly, you know, jet setting, flying around their own private jets, buying expensive cars, thinking that greed is good. It pushes an entirely new mindset that goes ahead and, and, and distances us from one another. We can't possibly care about each other because the other person is our enemy. Neoliberalism is an anti-democratic ideology. It doesn't believe that human beings, particularly common human beings, are capable of understanding anything, hardly. It moves liberal democracy, using representative government, from a means of living into a consumer democracy in which you and I only vote through our, our, our capital, through what we buy. This, by the way, should sound familiar. It's why we're having constant consumer battles in this culture war. What movies should I watch? What television shows should I watch? What brand of sneakers should I buy? What ends up happening is it diffuses Democratic principles, including organizing, including uh, uh, solidarity, labor unions, you name it. It gets rid of all of that and replaces it with an illusion, which is what Reagan and Thatcher were always about. You know, when we start taking a look at this era, we need to start taking a look at the fact that these people are just PR agents. They're just actors who are presenting ideas to us and giving it to, them, giving it to us in, in an appealing sheen, right? They're selling us on ideas. They're basically selling us on the ideas that will harm us. Ronald Reagan didn't have much in the way of ideology. I mean, you know, he was originally a Democrat. Then, you know, he was uh, turning on people with the FBI and naming names. And the next thing you know, he is uh, governor of California and a Republican and, and warning about socialism. What Reagan does, though, is he takes a lot of these ideas that have been handed to him by institutes and think tanks that are funded by the billionaires that we talked about earlier with the, the Powell memo. He starts going ahead and, and just using their guides to the presidency, which is all neoliberalism. From the very beginning, that's all that this is. And he goes out and sells it to people and says it's, you know, sunshine, morning in America. It's just a sales job. And the sales job is meant to make us vote against our own interest using fear of, of the other, the idea that other people are coming for us, paranoia of supernatural evil and conspiracies around every corner, distrust of the people who live next to us, the people we work with, and appealing to this, this want for an alternate reality in which all things are better, at least it will be for me when I make my money in an America where winners are winners and losers are losers. It fundamentally changes the reality of the world. Now, as I mentioned, when Ronald Reagan was racking up electoral victory after electoral victory, the Democratic Party in the United States of America uh, had to, to kind of look at the situation and, and reconfigure and reconsider who they were. The Democrats uh, had, had largely been a party that, uh, you know, represented workers, represented African Americans, represented women, more or less running on the idea that the inequality in the country was intentional and needed to be dealt with. It needed to change. What happens, though, in the 1980s going into the 1990s is that the Democratic Party uh, says, you know what, Reaganism is one. We will never beat this. There is no possibility that we will ever fundamentally challenge Reaganism again. It's, it's too strong. We have to change who we are. And as a result, the Democratic Party says, you know what, these, these groups, uh, African Americans, the poor women, um, they'll, they'll vote for us no matter what. What are they going to do, vote for the Republicans? And as a result, they start moving to, in the direction of neoliberalism. They start reaching out to corporations, large donors. They start going after uh, developing what, what you eventually would end up calling the professional managerial class, the people who make sure and overlook the workers and keep them on their tasks, the educated class, which is something we're going to talk about in the next video, in the final episode of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series. The Democrats in end up winning a surprise election when Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton unseats uh, sitting President George H.W. Bush. And under Clinton, what you see is a 
push of the Reaganist agenda in a lot of ways. Of course, what the Democrats come to understand, and particularly Bill Clinton comes to understand, is that you can go ahead and push Reaganism, but what made it really powerful in the political sense was the sense of optimism. George H.W. Bush uh, didn't quite have that, right? He wasn't able to sort of inspire people with his agenda. He was a technocrat. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton was able to put a human face on Reaganism, so to speak. But what we see in a lot of ways is uh, the development of the modern Democratic Party. In order to appeal to uh, centrist voters, uh, so-called independents, uh, we see a push against crime. Uh, we see a ton of money that is absolutely flooded into law enforcement in the prison industry. Uh, we also see further deregulation. Uh, some of the most uh, considerable deregulation takes place in telecommunications as we're starting to uh, to build up towards this modern era and eventually the, the internet digital age. And what happens is that we start like allowing these big giant corporate mergers and, and, and all of a sudden people like I don't know, Rupert Murdoch start buying up uh, television stations and the airwaves. And you start having these massive conglomerates who are starting to determine everything that's happening in the country. What goes along with that is the development of free trade or eventually the development of what has now come to be referred to as neoliberal globalism. As the USSR dies. And it dies for a variety of reasons. Uh, it, it involves uh, a completely sclerotic uh, leadership class, uh, a, a complete system of distrust and dishonesty, uh, an inability to go ahead and prepare for the digital age. I mean, it, it, it never ends. If you take a look at Joseph Stalin, his betrayal of, of the project from the very, very, very beginning probably dooms it. But what you see in the, the collapse of the Soviet Union is that the world structure starts being arranged according to the American international financial idea. Um, you, you basically see a, a machine that is created. And it's, it's, it's always referred to by, by certain people as, of course, the, the first, second, and third world system. You have a first world. And again, the, the, it's really ugly when you think about it this way. But the first world includes you know, the United States of America, the, the tastemaker, the hegemonic power. The first world countries, their citizens are going to have the best possible lives, right? They're going to have uh, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, but it, it, they're also going to benefit from things such as cheap goods, luxury goods, everything that the world market can totally provide, right? And as a result, they'll go ahead and oversee the logistics of it. They'll think of the things. They'll be the creative types. And, you know, if you listen to Bill Clinton's speeches, it's the belief that basically everybody, there's going to be like a very thin group of wealthy people, and then everybody else is going to get sucked up into the middle class. Because what's going to happen around the world is the rest of the world will go ahead and comprise the working class. The second and third world countries basically are turned into nodes in a larger machine. Uh, you know, there are going to be some secondary powers in there, but you're mostly going to see a lot of countries around the world where most of its resources are, are, are found. Their resources are going to be mined and then processed by the major powers. Uh, they're going to be able to get these goods cheap. And by the way, they're going to rely on dictators and anti-democratic leaders in order to make sure that there's never going to be any sort of like a leftist movement in these countries. And this comes again after Operation Condor, where a lot of these people have been murdered. It is a really stifling, ugly thing that takes place in these countries. Their resources are taken from them on the cheap, and their people are forced into subservient roles. They have no real opportunity to, you know, enjoy any of the spoils of the system. You know, people can sit around and talk about how, oh, capitalism has lifted so many people out of poverty. Well, it's also put a lot of people into poverty and into terrible circumstances. You know, a lot of the protections uh, of American labor, uh, the 40-hour work week, the regulations within the factory, the, all of those things, like the, the eradication of child labor, those things go never, never existed if they, you know, had ever even had a glimmer of them. In these, you know, countries that have been fitted into this system, their children are working, 
Their people are working ungodly hours. They're being paid barely cents on a dollar. And what happens with free trade is it opens up the borders in order to make this possible. More or less, these corporations are given carte blanche over the world in order to go ahead and get the resources here in one country, get them processed here, get them get the labor cheap here, and then bring it to the United States of America, or one of the major industrial powers, and go ahead and, and have people buy them. There's a few problems in this. Besides the fact that it's exploiting people around the world, it's damning them to awful, awful exploited lives. One problem is it goes ahead in the United States of America and just absolutely hollows out the interior. These places where manufacturing was taking place, places like the Rust Belt, um, they are absolutely devastated as those jobs are sent to other countries like Mexico, where you can have cheap labor so they can go ahead and move things around without having to worry about uh, regulations like you have them in the United States of America. The people who had benefited from the development of that industry and that manufacturing, they're left on their own. And then, strangely enough, because of this new economy that is touted by everybody, you have to start going to college in order to become specialized labor. That creates a captive market. That means if you want to go ahead and participate in the economy, you're going to have to go to college. That means that colleges are then going to go ahead and jack up their prices. There's going to be a huge run with administrators who require a ton of pay for this professional managerial class. And as a result, not everybody can get that education. You might have to take on tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to do it. I, I, I'm one of those people who had to make that deal. Meanwhile, war on drugs, which has been an absolute uh, awful, awful situation for decades. Just a joke. Uh, it continues to roll on. Uh, vulnerable communities, marginalized communities that are getting the raw deal in all of this. Uh, they're just being arrested and thrown in jail and, and used for labor while in jail while they're there. Uh, instead of investing in communities, instead of creating social safety nets, instead of working on the old New Deal type ideas that could make people's lives better and, you know, it, inc make better lives in the country in general, Instead, that a percentage of that money is pushed towards law enforcement and uh, imprisoning these people. Meanwhile, c corporations and companies are taking advantage of this deregulated place. Uh, they're charging people incredible fees. Uh, they're, they're selling them harmful products. Uh, they've, they've just moved away from anything even approaching customer service. And uh, there's no one there to protect them anymore. Those things have gone by the wayside as neoliberalism has become the operating consensus of the world. It leaves people frustrated, and rightfully so. It leaves people feel, feeling like their government has been bought off, which it has. It leaves people feeling like their country has been absolutely corrupted, which it has. Me, and, and, and as this is happening, the powerful are just continuing to push this idea of what they call the American century. They believe, like a lot of former empires, including the British Empire, including the Roman Empire, that they have created a system, an order that will last forever. And that idea is so consuming that the United States must use its military and must use its markets in order to go ahead and set the world to, uh, to the settings that it wants, that will go ahead and prevent any future competitor from ever, ever pushing against the United States again. Uh, this is the absolute dream of so many people, Republican and Democrat, but largely a group of people called the neoconservatives. Uh, as they're putting together their ideas of what necessarily should happen uh, based on uh, a, a lot of uh, old ideology that we could talk about uh, ad nauseum here, 
But they believe that the United States should do everything in its power to spread American-style democracy around the world. And even in the 1990s, they have their eyes set on one country in particular, and that is Iraq, where they are advocating for the removal of Saddam Hussein, who is, by the way, for the record, a former American asset, an ally who we armed in order to destabilize Iran. They are continually pushing for an invasion of Iraq, the opening up of its markets and the gathering of their oil and their resources, and the spreading of American ideas in order to continue pushing into old territories where the United States was not able to gather a foothold during the Cold War. Well, by 2001, a few years into what we would call the end of history, history starts back up. We watch in September of 2001 as two planes crash into the World Trade Center. Another plane crashes into the Pentagon, and the United States is uh, in a state of war. And a lot of these people who have pushed for the new American century, for a continued American empire, are going to use this tragedy as their opportunity to try and remake the world. Well, they're not going to do it. Or rather, they go ahead and contribute to the decline and ultimately probably the fall of the American empire. We'll get into that in the last episode of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series. I just want to say thank you again for all of your support, all of your kindness. Um, the feedback I've been getting from the Midnight Kingdom uh, has, has been just absolutely overwhelming. Uh, it means the world to me that you read these books, you watch these videos. As always, if you haven't ordered your copy, order that copy. If you haven't subscribed or liked uh, videos on this channel, please do so. It helps get the word out. But also tell people about this. Get them a copy of The Midnight Kingdom. Send them links to these videos because we're having conversations here that other people simply aren't having. And the hope is is to get accurate information out there so that we can go ahead and end this trench warfare, this absolutely farcical state that we're in, in which we can't even have discussions about where we've been and where we're going simply because of these conspiracy theories, white supremacist lies, and religious mythologies. Thanks again for everything, and we'll be back soon with the final episode of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series.